I should say welcome everyone to the uh, to the uh, speaker series of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. Uh, I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the Institute, and I am delighted to welcome our speaker, who is Professor G. Lee, uh, teaches business and law at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, Professor Lee was going to be with us in New York this morning because of the serious rainstorm and windstorm that we had yesterday. He was not able to get off the ground from California, so we're doing this entirely on Zoom. Uh, so apologies to any of you who had hoped to meet him in person here at NYU. So Professor Lee uh, began his legal career as a corporate and tax lawyer in a big law firm here in New York. And um, Perhaps he was inspired by that. He can tell us if that's the case. Uh, he was certainly, uh, I'm sure he was informed by that experience. He has produced a interesting body of work examining the delivery of legal services to Chinese companies. So questions like how do Chinese multinationals use legal services? Uh, who do they hire? Is it in-house legal counsel, outside counsel? Do they use American lawyers or Chinese lawyers or no lawyers on their legal team? So he has a new book out, Negotiating Legality, Chinese Companies in the U.S. Legal System, in which he pulls together a truly impressive amount of new data to examine not just um, Chinese companies' behavior as legal service consumers, but he also develops a theory about why they do what they do, which is great so we can finally uh, move off of our assumptions and even our stereotypes about how uh, Chinese companies behave as legal consumers. So with that, I'm going to give the mic to you, uh, Professor Lee, uh, take it away. All right, well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Catherine, uh, for organizing this uh, this event and uh, thanks to, to Amy for arranging the uh, Zoom seminar. Um, and uh, I, I would, I'm grateful for uh, you know, every one of you for uh, joining us, uh, especially for those who are, are in California. This is really early in the morning. Uh, so um, as Catherine, um, you know, uh, the generous uh, introduction. Um, so um, this, I've been working on um, Chinese multinationals in the US for, um, more than 10 years. And so um, uh, here's the, the PowerPoint slides. Um, 2018, I published a book. Uh, that book was mainly about Chinese uh, multinationals. Um, and the, 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 that book is, examines their compliance with US laws and regulations. And when that, that book came out, uh, Trump started uh, uh, it came out at around the time when uh, Trump started a trade war with China. Uh, so I, I thought that helped with the sale of the book. Um, and uh, uh, this year in May, uh, my second book uh, will, will come out. And uh, this this book focus, focus on Chinese multinationals in the US and how they adapt or fail to adapt it to the US legal system, right? How they, as, as Catherine um, uh, briefly described, how they interact with lawyers, uh, whether they develop an internal legal capacity, uh, how they resolve disputes, um, and how they litigate in US courts. Uh, a broad overview of uh, all the major issues Chinese uh, multinationals may encounter when they interact with the US legal system. So it will, the book will come out again, um, it's pub published by Cambridge uh, University Press. It, uh, it will come out in May, right? Uh, uh, this is election year and Chinese multinationals and again in the spotlight um, in the US. Um, so I, 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 you know, it's just coincidence that, you know, but the, the, the timing is pretty good. I hope uh, it will help with the sale of the book. All right, uh, so without further ado, let, let me get to the substance of the book and um, um, here. Um, so this is the table of contents, um, um, the main topics that the book will address. Um, and so uh, today, uh, because of the time uh, limit, I'll focus on two chapters. The first one um, is on in-house legal 
capacity of Chinese multinationals in the U.S. And uh, then Chapter 5, which is on Chinese um, companies uh, litigating in U.S. federal courts. So there's the last chapter, Chapter 6, um, is also uh, uh, interesting, especially uh, given the current uh, uh, geopolitical context, right? The last chapter is about Chinese companies' reactions to uh, perceived mistreatment by U.S. government agencies, right? So TikTok will be a good example. Um, so, uh, you know, the current uh, House bill uh, aimed at uh, banning uh, TikTok, right? That too many is a mistreatment, right? A fair treatment of this Chinese company. Um, well, a Chinese company, I mean, this, uh, this company uh, controlled by a, a, a company that headquartered in China. So that's a broad definition of Chinese company. Uh, even though if you look at the you know place of incorporation or headquarters of TikTok, it's not uh, uh, strictly speaking a Chinese company. Um, so how, how do Chinese multinationals, if treated unfairly by US government, how do they react, right? So that's the uh, topic for chapter six. Um, I will uh, not focus on it today. Uh, for those who, of you who are really interested, you know, please buy the book. Uh, all right, um, so, a brief background, and this is, uh, you know, the chart shows you the trajectory of Chinese FDI, both inbound and outbound. You see that uh, um, starting from around uh, um, 2016, 2017, there was uh, a surge in um, Chinese outbound FDI, and then it dropped because of um, uh, both Chinese government's concern about uh, capital flight and also uh, the uh, external environment for Chinese FDI started to become more hostile, uh, which uh, um, deterred uh, a lot of uh, Chinese investors from uh, moving their investments abroad. And then uh, COVID also had its, uh, its effects. Um, and uh, see similar trajectory of Chinese FDI in the U.S. Right, um, uh, start uh, at the peak. Well, the, the number surged right in the, from uh, 2010 to 2016, 17 peaked in, the, in 2016, 17, and then uh, Trump was elected. There was a U.S. China trade war, so. Um, Starting from 2019, you see the uh, drop and then uh, it stayed at a, a, a plateaued. So um, this is a cumulative uh, amount of Chinese FDI in the U.S. So uh, if you but if you look at the net number, right, the net, net volume of Chinese FDI, it actually uh, declined um, starting from 2018 and 19. All right, so that's the general background. So now let's uh, get to uh, the legal aspect of Chinese um, uh, multinationals um, in the US. So I, I'll start, uh, I'll use TikTok as example, right? Uh, TikTok is, has caused so much attention. So uh, if you look at the TikTok's legal experience in the US, right, it's, it acquired music Lee, um, in 2017, and um, um, so I, I would consider that as the uh, as the year where it, it uh, started to be exposed to the to the U.S. market and the U.S. legal uh, system. Uh, 2017, there was only one lawsuit, and 2018, no lawsuit. Right? Well, the the company uh, grow exponentially in the U.S. Uh, very little legal risks uh, in, in the U.S. And then 2019, only four lawsuits, right? Still insignificant considering the size of the company and its growth uh, in, in the U.S. market. And then 2020, right, uh, lawsuits exploded, right? 38 uh, lawsuits. Um, 
And uh, so that's, you know, the trajectory of legal, uh, uh, of Chinese multinationals exposure to U.S. legal risks. Um, and so altogether, um, TikTok, well, during this time span, um, had 39 lawsuits um, as defendants, right? Uh, TikTok was sued by other parties and only four lawsuits were initiated by TikTok. So it was the plaintiff in only four cases and three out of the four uh, were cases where uh, TikTok sued the US government. So uh, this is very interesting, right? Quite different from uh, American companies. Um, if, the, the, if you compare the experience to US companies, it's quite different, quite uh, 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 unique. But is this different from other Chinese companies, right? So uh, the answer is probably not. If you look at uh, these three other prominent Chinese multinationals in the US, they, they have similar uh, experience in the US legal system, right? If you look at Lenovo, Huawei, and Fuyao. Um, so for all of these three companies, they started from a very limited uh, number of lawsuits in the US and then uh, grows right, uh, over time. Uh, and then picked for uh, companies like uh, 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 both uh, Lenovo and Huawei um, at a certain point, 2015, number of lawsuits uh, picked and then started to drop, right? Uh, and it started to take measures to prevent uh, lawsuits from being filed. Actually, the more important thing is that they, they took measures to prevent lawsuits from <laughs> getting started in the, in the first place. But look at what happened to Huawei, right? Just starting from 2019, 2020, the number of lawsuits uh, 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 searched again. Uh, what happened? Well, uh, many lawsuits were filed by Huawei against the U.S. government. Uh, so that's similar to what happened to, to TikTok, right? Um, uh, so those are just, you know, additional anecdotes and this additional case studies to show you that uh, the experience uh, for TikTok was though different from American companies, not that different from other Chinese, uh, prominent Chinese uh, multinationals. So this book uh, just explores their experiences more systematically. All right, so um, very briefly, uh, uh, some literature uh, review. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't start from scratch. There has been some bodies of uh, research about um, multinationals in, in the US legal system. So first, I, I think the, this, this line of literature about uh, comparative institutional uh, analysis uh, um, pioneered by Professor Kagan and, and uh, his colleagues, they, can, they look at uh, multinational corporations and they look at how they uh, adapt to these different regulatory systems uh, with a focus on the US. Right. They find that the U.S. Um, regulatory institution is rather unique, right? quite different. It's, it's adversarial, it's lawyer-driven, and it's very costly. So they, they compare multinationals' uh, experiences in, um, in interacting with, uh, from interacting with U.S. regulators. And... Um, and uh, the, the conclusion is that the U.S. regulatory system is very costly, inefficient, and uh, very risky for, for multinational corporations. But their research um, primarily focused on European companies and Japanese multinationals. So there's really little study about uh, uh, multinationals from emerging markets such as China. Um, so, so a lot of questions that interest me um, are left open, right? So such, such as how uh, a state ownership of multinationals may implicate their interactions with US legal system. That's, that question has not been addressed in, in this literature. Um, another literature is about liability foreignness. Um, uh, scholars in this uh, area basically uh, uh, focus on um, the disadvantages of multinationals when they have to litigate in U.S. courts. And they find that um, multinationals are sued more often in U.S. courts uh, because of their 
lack of familiarity with the U.S. legal system. That, that's very interesting insight. And uh, I, I, in my book, I uh, refer back to this uh, literature from time to time. I find I, I, I find a similar uh, evidence in, in my research that the Chinese multinationals are not that familiar with U.S. courts, and that has consequence uh, on their uh, preferences and behavior. Um, in, in the U.S. legal system. And then there's another literature about xenophobia uh, in U.S. courts. Uh, the question is whether uh, U.S. courts, U.S. judges and juries are uh, biased against the foreign parties, foreign litigants. Uh, and the findings are mixed. Some find uh, biases, others not. So, um, you know, my, my research will contribute to that debate. And uh, there's another uh, uh, literature on uh, foreign shopping. Uh, foreign parties try to get into U.S. courts so that uh, uh, they can uh, receive um, higher damages uh, from torturous uh, acts committed outside the U.S. So that's the focus of this literature. Uh, it's not that relevant to the to this study, but. Um, um, it just shows you that U.S. courts are, uh, in general, uh, a little more hostile towards corporate actors. Uh, so it attracts uh, plaintiffs uh, to U.S. courts against uh, big corporations, regardless of their uh, of their uh, their headquarters, the location of their headquarters, their, their domicile. All right, so. Um, uh, basically, the takeaway from this is that uh, there's very little study on Chinese multinationals, very little study about uh, multinationals from any emerging market in the U.S. and how they how they uh, adapt to the U.S. legal system. So I hope this book will, will um, fill that uh, knowledge gap. All right. So um, bra uh, you know, I uh, came up with this uh, theoretical framework. Um, so um, I argue that uh, Chinese multinationals operate in a transnational field that straddles two um, institutional settings. One is the U.S. institutional context. They operate in the U.S., right? They set up, uh, they're incorporated in the U.S. for, for those who operate as uh, subsidiaries. So they are U.S. corporations uh, mostly, and uh, they have to they are subject to, to, to U.S. jurisdiction. They have to comply with U.S. laws and regulations. They are subject to U.S. courts, uh, 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 juris, adjudicative uh, jurisdiction in, in the U.S. So uh, when they sued, they, they have to answer, right? They have to go to court to fight it. So, uh, so therefore, they, they must adapt to the U.S. institutional environment. So that, that that's the... That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that they are also controlled by investors from China, right? Uh, so they are also at the same time subject to the influence of institutions in China, both formal institutions and informal institutions. The formal ones are, you know, laws and regulations and uh, 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 sometimes policies, if we're talking about uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, and the informal ones are, you know, norms and culture, right, uh, of the Chinese, uh, you know, because a lot of the um, managers in the U.S. were Chinese uh, expatriates, right? They were sent from uh, by the Chinese headquarters. They are norm carriers, right? They, they carry their cultural and a normative background to the U.S., so which will be reflected in their uh, preferences and behaviors when they interact with uh, different uh, stakeholders in the U.S. legal system. So, so I, I think we have to, I argue that when we look at uh, the interactions between Chinese multinationals and the U.S. legal system, we have to keep this transnational field in mind. We have to keep the dual institutional context in mind and look at how these two institutional uh, 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 environments influence the preferences and the behaviors of uh, Chinese multinationals. Um, 
And um, so this, uh, by presenting, by, by applying this uh, framework, I am in conversation with two broader institution, uh, 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 camps of institutionalism. One is uh, sociological institutionalism, the other is the econo uh, institutional economics. Um, sociological institutionalism um, uh, focus on, you know, the, the, the main arguments is the isomorphism, right? Uh, institutional isomorphism. Uh, corporations tend to converge in, in, in terms of their behavior uh, because they want to gain legitimacy in the institutional environment. They want to mimic others' behavior. And so this literature, however, has this problem with, um, you know, lack of agency, right, in, in the research. Um, so they, they just concentrate on the convergence uh, of all companies, right? Uh, so they don't look at the intercompany variations in, in their preferences and behavior. So I think that is a drawback of the literature. And uh, so my research focus both on the broader institutional context and also on the agency part of it. Uh, so I look at the intercompany variations in their preferences and behaviors. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, institutional economics, they, they look at agency, but they also uh, they tend to neglect uh, informal institutions. Uh, so they don't look at norms and culture. Um, why? Because uh, for most of their study, empirical study, uh, the norm, normative part is static, right? Culture doesn't change very quickly. So, the, you know, it justify this, uh, they justify the, the overlook, uh, the neglect uh, of this cultural variable. But for my, for, for look, for study about Chinese multinationals in the U.S., because of, uh, because of their exposure to, to conflicting norms uh, and the cultures, you know, this, this variable is no longer static, right? It, it, it's a variable that varies. So you have to look at this variable, and that's how I think my paper, uh, my my book, will contribute to to that uh, broader debate. All right, and so two recurring questions uh, in this book are uh, state ownership and uh, cultural differences experienced by Chinese multinationals in the U.S. I try to look at uh, potential effects of these two variables. Um, all right, so um, methodology, um, I, um, I collected survey data in collaboration with China General Chamber of Commerce, uh, the largest um, uh, business association for Chinese multinationals in the US. Um, I helped them design their annual survey and exchange. Uh, they allow me to use um, their data for, uh, for academic research. And uh, <laughs> I conducted interviews with 176 um, informants, uh, right? So here, here is um, the backgrounds. You can see they are from from backgrounds, uh, but they all are uh, uh, people who are familiar with uh, Chinese multinationals in in the U.S. And that also collected a huge amount of uh, archival data uh, from uh, Bloomberg Law. And, you know, the source of the data is the PACER, right? The, the federal court, uh, the, the online database for federal uh, uh, legal documents, right? So I collect all legal documents, federal legal documents uh, relating to all Chinese multinationals who uh, fill the 2019 CGCC survey, the Ch Chamber of Commerce survey, so that I can uh, link, connect their uh, legal, uh, the legal documents to their corporate uh, uh, background, corporate information to, to do uh, statistical analysis. Uh, I also collected the corporate data from Bloomberg itself, right? There's a very rich corporate data on on their website, so um, so basically, it's a mixed message, uh, mixed message combining both quantitative and qualitative data uh, um, about Chinese multinationals in the U.S. Um, U.S. legal system. So um, let me start with uh, chapter two. Just give you a quick uh, uh, peek into into the contents of the book. Um, so this chapter is about in-house uh, managers, in-house legal managers of Chinese 
multinationals in the U.S., right? Um, so there's, uh, for each of the chapter, I'll start with a literature review because you know, for the different topics, uh, you can find established scholarship uh, on the topic. Uh, but um, as the book shows, right, the, you know, the, the existing literature for each of the subject area has not looked at uh, multinationals from developing countries, uh, let alone Chinese multinationals in the US. So um, in the interest of time, I, I'll just very briefly uh, discuss the literature. Um, literature about the in-house council movement. In the US, companies are bringing, uh, in, over in, in the past few decades, uh, developing their internal legal capacity, right? To, to, to deliver legal services, produce legal services internally uh, to replace outside lawyers. Of course, they can, no US company can totally replace outside lawyers with in-house counsel, right? So, but the question is, um, why do they internalize the legal service production and to what extent do they do that, right? Um, so the literature basically says, well, you know, there, there are several factors. Uh, you, uh, U.S. government regulation is one, um, and uh, the uh, the increase of legal service costs is another. Uh, but uh, and, and there's a literature about um, uh, international human resource management, right? Uh, for multinationals, uh, how to staff their uh, legal managers is a question about human resource management. Do they expatriate uh, managers from their headquarters in China or do they rely on local recruits, right? That's the question they address. Um, but again, you know, uh, they, now, the, uh, now the existing studies have looked at um, Chinese multinationals uh, in the U.S. Um, so uh, applying the steel institutional framework, uh, I... Uh, I, um, I went through, you know, some of the key features of China's uh, in-house, uh, the, the Chinese institutional investment in, environment for in-house, uh, corporate in-house development, right? So, um, but, you know, of course, the, the dual institutional framework would uh, uh, suggest that I should look at both the Chinese and the U.S., institutional environment, but because the US one has been thoroughly uh, investigated, so I focus on the Chinese part, right? Um, so within the Chinese context, right, in the past decade or two, you probably heard about, you know, um, the Chinese um, uh, Yifa zhi guo, right? Yifa zhi guo. And so, so um, a rule of law in China. So the, the, the campaign is top-down campaign from, uh, 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 by, by the Chinese government. And as part of that campaign, broader campaign, uh, SASAC, you know, state administration of state-owned assets has um, uh, been pushing state-owned enterprises to develop internal legal capacity right? uh, as part of this rule of law China campaign. And this state-driven uh, uh, in-house movement is rather unique. It's, it's, you don't see that anywhere else, right? But it's so important in China. A lot of um, the development of in-house legal capacity, especially at state-owned enterprises, SOEs, really uh, a response to this top-down pressure. And at the same time, there's also a bottom-up uh, in-house development in China, right? Companies such as Alibaba, Huawei, they have uh, expensive uh, in-house legal department in China. Why? Because, uh, you know, China is also uh, moving towards more and more uh, a rule by law uh, a system, right? So law, even though compared to the U.S., law is still, uh, the role of law is still uh, less important, less uh, crucial for business transactions in China in comparison to the, to the U.S., but but over time, if you compare China today with China, you know the China twenty years ago, uh, law's role I, I would say is getting more and more important. So corporations want to address this risk, and so they have expensive, they have developed a uh, 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 very uh, sizable in-house legal uh, departments. And uh, but but for for the tech companies, most of the lawyers were. Um, uh, 
IP lawyers, right? Um, so it's, it's you know, the composition of uh, in-house league, uh, in-house counsel uh, is quite different in China uh, in Chinese companies than, than U.S. companies. All right, so that's the background, right? Uh, but overall, legal services are still undervalued in China in, in comparison to to the U.S. Uh, so that's that's the institutional context, and so how does that, how does the new institutional environment implicate their uh, uh, the the internal legal manager, right? The development of internal legal capacity by Chinese multinationals in the U.S. So here's the, some de descriptive data. You can see that. Uh, um, uh, the vast majority, the majority of them, uh, do not have in internal legal managers, right? Um, why? So if you ask them, you know, cost concern is, is the reason. It just their business here is not large enough to justify internal production of legal service, and um, um, also um, um, they they have alternative ways to to engage. Uh, lawyers who would pro uh, provide uh, stable legal services. Uh, and some of them just uh, underestimate the US legal risks. So they don't really engage, uh, they don't have a, uh, uh, they don't create this uh, position uh, of legal match manager in, in the US. Um, but 30% uh, of them do have such uh, positions established in the US. And uh, interviews uh, with them suggest with, with the managers suggest that you know again the cost is a concern, right? Is is probably for some of them is uh, cost less to to have a house manager, and also um, uh, some of them respond to SASAC pressure, right? Uh, the home state institutional pressure to establish internal legal capacity. So this is, you know, in response to the top-down pressure, they create these positions in the US and they have legal managers to uh, in charge of US legal uh, matters. And um, um, some of them, you know, complain about the lack of understanding by US lawyers about Chinese companies so U.S. legal service providers sometimes cannot provide uh, tailored services. As a result, they have to find someone uh, uh, who has, uh, who are often bilingual, bicultural, and uh, understand the, uh, the specific uh, forum, specific uh, information of Chinese uh, companies. And then they bring them in house so that they can properly advise uh, advise the companies, the managers, about the potential U.S. legal risks. All right. So that's but for those who are familiar with the literature, right? Uh, the the three smaller uh, categories are puzzling, right? Why would you hire? Why would you send a Chinese expatriate to the U.S. to manage U.S. legal matters? Why do you hire a layperson? To manage U.S. legal matters, right? Someone not licensed to practice U.S. law to be the manager of U.S. Uh, of the U.S. legal department. That's just puzzling, right? To to, to the American audience. So uh, why? Well, um, I did some tests, and so first the question is why would the Chinese multinationals send someone from the Chinese headquarters to the U.S. to be the U.S. legal manager, right? So uh, I find that state ownership is a significant variable um, here. So uh, more concretely, right, uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, state-owned Chinese companies are more likely to send someone from their headquarters to be the U.S. Man legal manager, right? So um, and the second variable that's uh, significant is the U.S. market importance. So if a uh, Chinese multinational consider U.S. Uh, business to be very important, they're more likely to send someone from the headquarters to manage U.S. legal matters. All right, so uh, both, uh, well, the first one I argue is the response to uh, the fact that uh, state-owned enterprises cannot find uh, uh, local candidates uh, who are knowledgeable about the specific nature of Chinese state-owned uh, SOEs. 
And also there's this lack of trust, right? They, they want someone from their inside or from their headquarters uh, who have built a, a, a track record, right? To, to be US legal managers because of the sensitive nature of their business. And also the second one is intuitive, right? If they take US business very seriously, they want some, someone they trust to be the US legal managers, right? They, they, there's someone that uh, they, they have, uh, they work together for a long time, right? So, so um, you, you can't find that it, um, uh, from the US uh, labor market. And uh, so how about uh, local hairs, right? Uh, um, well, I find these variables to be to be significant. First, the cultural challenge, right? So, uh, if some uh, Chinese multinational recruit locally, they are less likely to report cultural challenge. I, I, I don't think this. I think the causality is uh, uh, two direction, uh, two directional. Um, so, if you have local manager managing. Uh, the local operations, then you are likely less likely to experience local cultural challenges, and and also the other uh, the causality can go uh, the other way, right? If you have you you adapt uh, effectively, then you you probably have um, uh, less cultural challenge, and then probably you will prefer to hire a local lawyer because you understand the local expectations and you understand the uh, complexity of local regulations and local norms. Uh, so you'll be more inclined to recruit locally uh, uh, someone to, to manage U.S. legal matters. All right. And then um, these other uh, corporate attributes like investment size, recent m &A, also uh, are uh, positively correlated with the likelihood of uh, recruiting locally uh, someone to manage U.S. legal matters. So in the interest of time, I'll skip the detailed discussion. And uh, also I did some past about uh, the other uh, puzzling uh, uh, empirical finding that is um, of uh, hiring a, a layperson to be the U.S. legal manager, why would that? Why would just a uh, Chinese multinational do that? So um, it sh uh, the test findings shows that again, state ownership is uh, uh, correlated with this puzzling empirical finding. Right, state on no state on a Chinese multinational are more likely to hire a layperson. <laughs> a non-US lawyer to be the manager of US legal matters. Um, so why why is that? So based on my interviews, right, the same uh, same reasons uh, show up, right? Um, the Chinese SOEs don't trust lo um, uh, local people. Uh, they, they want to uh, expatriate someone from home, but that expatriated uh, Chinese manager, very likely, very likely, <laughs> Well, very unlikely to be a U.S. lawyer, right? Because you know that person grew up in the U.S. ecosystem. It's unlikely uh, to be someone who had trained in by U.S. law schools, in U.S. law schools, and passed the U.S. bar, become a U.S. lawyer. That's just almost. There's only one case in my study who fit that uh, uh, description. So it's um, and also <laughs> this is uh, you know sometimes they assign someone in response to the top down. Uh, pressure from SASAC. Um, all they have to do is just establish this position and then stuff the position with someone. It doesn't have to be a U.S. lawyer. That's not required by SASAC rules. Um, so that's just, you know, window dressing, if you may call it. So um, because of that, you know, it could be someone without U.S. Uh, uh, license, um, not, not a U.S. lawyer. All right, so and um, similar findings for the second uh, second uh, de uh, dependent variable, second scenario. All right, um, so that's first one. Um, you know, you see the differences between Chinese multinationals and multinationals from other countries. Um, and also you see how the dual institutional influences actually modify their preferences and behavior. And uh, 
so chapter five further uh, substantiate the effect of this dual institutional uh, pressure. And uh, again, I focus, you know, the two variables of interest to me will be the ownership type and uh, the normative difference between China and the US. All right, so um, theoretically, right, um, um, there should be differences between Chinese um, state-owned uh, multinationals and, and the rest of Chinese multinationals. Why? Well, uh, because of the agency problem, right, yeah, yeah, which is uh, inherent uh, in Chinese SOEs, uh, you, they tend to uh, re uh, react to disputes. They, they, they tend to resolve disputes in a suboptimal way because of the agency problem. And uh, uh, because, you know, uh, their incentives are structured in such a way that a super risk averse, right? And there's, um, uh, they, they behave more like a bureaucrats, less like, like a, a business, uh, business people, right? Of course, uh, in any big multinational, you have agency problem, right? That's the, you know, it, 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 is universal, right? Um, so here I, I'm only talking about, you know, the difference in matter of degree and also nature, right? Um, um, for most multinational corporations from US and Europe, um, the, the uh, profit maximization is it's their primary business purpose. But for SOEs, right, very often profit, profit maximization is not their top priority, right? Um, because of the you know structure of their uh, because of the institutional structure for Chinese SOEs, so um, that is reflected in uh, the management behavior at any level, right, and anywhere, including uh, in in the United States. All right, so so uh, that uh, severe and, and a unique agency problem shapes uh, dispute resolution preferences and behavior of Chinese uh, Chinese multinationals, and um, um, and uh, normative influence from uh, from China, right? Um, litigation in China means different things, right? Um, so um, you you probably heard about this debate. Uh, I've been enduring debate for decades, right? Uh, Chinese uh, culture does not encourage litigation. U.S. culture is more pro-litigation. That's very crude comparison, right? I, I go beyond that. Um, I, I think um, Chinese norms, um, China has over time developed a specific norm system, normative system that regulates dispute resolution, regulate litigation. Uh, uh, so it just, you know, litigation means, uh, it carries very complex set of normative meanings than litigation in, China, in the US. For corporate actors, litigation in the US just part of doing business, right? Uh, managers don't take it personally, right? And they can sue US government. It's, it's, it's just business, right? So even after litigation, right after lawsuits, you know, you can see both parties, lawyers hang out, right? Uh, after the lawsuit, they they they're still colleagues. They are they're friendly with each other. They don't take lawsuits as some as personal offense. Definitely not an insult. Uh, but in China, right, because of the complex normative system that regulates um, litigation, sometimes it's really a uh, and game behavior. Um, if you have long-term uh, cooperative uh, relationship, managers tend to avoid litigation. And if they do go to court, tend to signal some uh, hostility or end game uh, 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 behavior. Uh, but sometimes, you know, they, they take it, take litigation personally. They consider uh, a lawsuit as a personal offense. And uh, they would react with uh, litigation. They would say, well, if you treat me this way, if you insult me with a lawsuit, I will, I'll litigate back. I'll litigate. I'll, I'll insist on litigation. It's the kind of litigation as a retaliation because of the 
the normative uh, 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 meaning, the normative connotation, right, uh, uh, of litigation in China. So the arguments that the Chinese normative system regulate litigation differently from the U.S. normative system. All right. So with that in mind, let's look at how Chinese uh, multinationals uh, litigate in the U.S. So first question. Right. Uh, let's look at their their preferences. Right. Uh, as this chart shows you, um, they they uh, the question is you know compared to their preference in China, do they are they more likely to litigate or settle uh, in in the U.S. when there's a legal dispute? Well, um, surprisingly, right, 62, 64 percent of the uh, survey respondents wanted uh, more likely to to settle. Right. And that's um, curious why? Because here you have more independent courts, more efficient, well, more more powerful courts, right? If you have disputes, why don't you litigate? Uh, all right. So uh, then, uh, that's uh, the reason is that uh, it's cost, right? The two two reasons. One is cost, uh, and it's primary reason. Right, um, and there's a literature out there, right? If litigation is costly, parties will settle, right, <laughs> to save the cost. But also uh, you see the normative influence from their Chinese background, right? Litigation is bad for reputation, right? To almost more than 20% of the survey respondents, they still think litigation is bad, uh, uh, has this negative impact on their business reputation, right? So, um, and this is not, this is a broad question. It's not a question about any specific lawsuit that may actually have bad PR effect. But this is a very broad question, right? Uh, it has, it gauges this um, uh, uh, general uh, uh, preferences for litigation by Chinese managers. And they, they, can, they, they connect litigation to um, bad, uh, reputational damage. So I argue that I think this is, this reflect this, uh, normative influence from their Chinese uh, home home state institution, uh, informal uh, informal institutions, and when they have disputes, uh, how do they? What do they do? All right, uh, do they hire a lawyer immediately or they wait? <laughs> and here, well, you see both a sign of adaptation and some uh, evidence of home state normative uh, institutional influence. So um, the vast majority of them will get lawyer uh, immediately on board, but still 13, 14% would wait until they they couldn't settle the dispute uh, and then they get a lawyer. So uh, you see the influence of both, you see evidence of both adaptation and inertia, right? Influence from host, uh, host state uh, normative influence. And one, how do they find a lawyer? This is the lawyer selection preferences. Well, practice experience, very important. So is cost, right? Those are the two most important considerations when they find one Chinese managers go look for US lawyers. And here's, the, you know, uh, I, I look at some case studies. Here are the lawyers, uh, uh, Lenovo, in this case that Lenovo use. Uh, when they litigate in U.S. courts, look, oh, now, now them is a Chinese lawyer, right? They prefer uh, local litigators, and also they don't really they, they, they care about the experience. All these lawyers had decades of uh, lit litigation experience, and only very few actually uh, went to top law schools. So they, they don't really care about credentials; they care about the experience. Um, and they, most of them uh, lit IP litigators. Uh, all right, so um, how many cases have they uh, have Chinese uh, multinationals litigated in, in US courts? It varies, right, uh, varies. And um, um, well, most of them only litigated a few cases in the US, but some of them actually were are repeat players. And the question then is, what explains the intercompany Variations. Why some litigate so many and some barely? Uh, here, uh, this is the interesting uh, empirical uh, findings, right? Uh, first, uh, 
for SOEs, uh, I find that uh, state-owned Chinese companies are sued more often in U.S. federal courts than private companies. And why? Uh, it goes back to my earlier argument. I think they, because of the agency problem, right? They are they resolve disputes uh, uh, in a suboptimal way. Um, efficiency is not their top concern. Um, so. Um, they react uh, to disputes slowly because of the reporting system. And uh, sometimes they, they insist on litigating because they don't want to struck, strike on any settlement deals because settlement deals may uh, cost, uh, may cause some suspicion at the headquarters. So for all these agency issues, right, the uh, SOEs are sued more often in U.S. federal courts. And then uh, duration is a strong variable, which makes perfect sense. The longer you uh, you operate in the U.S., the more likely you are sued or you sue someone, right? <laughs> Litigation is a part of doing business in the U.S. And uh, uh, revenue is another significant variable. Again, it makes perfect sense. If you are a large, uh, you have large operations in the U.S., you have more legal issues. You have, you have more disputes, so you litigate more often, right? So that's that's intuitive. Um, and then uh, sectoral regulation, if you operate in heavily regulated sectors, you are more likely to be sued in federal courts. Make, again, this is intuitive because federal courts are courts of uh, limited uh, subject matter jurisdictions where often you need, uh, you, you need a federal, federal course of action. So, uh, and, uh, so, so uh, U.S. federal regulations provide plaintiffs with that cause of action, so they can sue Chinese uh, companies in federal courts. And uh, uh, cultural challenge is a, is a significant variable, right? Uh, again, you know, I wouldn't say the. I, I think the uh, there's a, the causality is both ways, right? Uh, if you face enormous cultural challenge in the U.S you're more likely to have conflicts with local stakeholders and which give rise to legal disputes and the lawsuits. And uh, also maybe because you're sued more often, you will complain about the cultural kind of challenges. So, you know, the, the causality may go both ways. And lastly, uh, in-house counsel is strongly correlated with uh, the likelihood of being sued in, in federal courts. Uh, so this uh, evidence suggests that uh, Chinese companies hire uh, in-house counsel as a defense mechanism, right? When they are sued from time to time, they think, well, we better have a in-house legal manager to advise us about the, all these lawsuits or how to prevent lawsuits in the future. So, that, so that's why you see this significance uh, in the finding. All right, so um, contributions in the interest of time, I will skip all these contributions, uh, but uh, you know, uh, I, I think um, by now uh, I have already uh, demonstrated that uh, you know this the the contribution of the both the theoretical framework and the empirical findings. Well, thank you for your patience. I, I would like to open you know Q and A, uh, and looking forward to your to your questions and, and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there was um, a lot of data there, which um, we may have to come back to and refer to with the questions. I think um, I see one question already in the queue. I would encourage others to jump in with some questions and I'm just gonna throw out a few at the beginning to get us going. Um, one thing struck me just now, you said that in your sample, there was only one case of a lawyer who had who was Chinese, a Chinese national, Chinese born, and U.S. trained and licensed, being in-house counsel in your sample group, and that seems kind of amazing in the light of the large number of Chinese nationals who have been coming to U.S. law schools for about twenty years now. Um, certainly, yeah, I would say from the early '80s, we were seeing growing numbers <clears throat> initially as LLMs and now more recently also a large number or significant number of JDs. And they typically take the bar 
uh, exam and um, work for Chinese law firms, also U.S. law firms. So I would have thought they would have been the natural uh, hiring pool for these companies, right? That's so. That's my first question. And second related question for is, what is the role of the Chinese law firms that have set up offices in the U.S.? Because there are quite a few of those as well. The, all of the large Chinese corporate law firms have a presence here in New York, in D.C., and I'm sure out in California as well. So they also would seem to be a natural choice for a Chinese company. But I, in my quick perusal of your chart, I didn't see King and Wood, for example, among the firms who were listed as being hired um, by, I think it was Lenovo that you threw up the chart for. So if you could talk about that, that would be great. Thank you. Those are very good questions. Um, so, uh, um, so first of all, um, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, you know, increasing number of Chinese students came to come to the U.S. Uh, get an LLM, and many of them, after an LLM program, would go back to China. The vast majority of them would, uh, you know, find a firm, uh, play uh, jobs at law firms, or they just, you know, took one year off their law firm uh, practice and get an LLM, right? What, what we call du jin, right? Uh, um, so, um, uh, but the thing is that uh, in Chinese multinational, uh, in Chinese SOEs, uh, you know, I focus on SOEs uh, when, when I made that comment. So Chinese SOEs is really a hierarchy, right? People climb the corporate uh, ladder, you know, uh, slowly, right, step by step. So um, the Chinese for Chinese studying in the U.S. is really uh, it happened only in the last decade or two. You have a you know a growing number of, of Chinese studying getting U.S. degrees and passing the U.S. bar, and then return to China. It happened in the past decade. So um, for most of them, they haven't really got to the top management level yet. So um, and so um, for Chinese uh, SOEs, when they expatriate top managers, right, the, their candidate pool is limited. And uh, the returning Chinese in-house lawyers very often haven't got to that top level yet. So the only one case I, I had is the Chinese SOE uh, uh, recruited a uh, someone who got an LLM from a top U.S. Uh, law school and went back to China, not went back to Hong Kong, working for a big U.S. firm uh, as associate. Then uh, was hired, recruited by this Chinese uh, multinational, and this Chinese multinational. Uh, uh, compared to, uh, it's really in the finance uh, sector. It's very, it's relatively new, and the top managers were all returnees, right? They, they all got many of them got foreign uh, edu uh, educational credentials, so they're more uh, pro, right? They're more inclined to hire, you know, younger returnees with for U.S. education, and uh, give assign them high uh, management position jobs. So, so, and then when they opened the office in the US, they signed this U US lawyer, uh, a Chinese who got US uh, license to, to be the representative. So that's the only one case. It's rather unique, even compared to, to other Chinese SOEs. So that's, that's why, you know, there's the hierarchy of Chinese SOEs. That, so that, so might some of these more recent graduates, somebody who's been a few years out of their U.S. law school experience, a few years of bar membership, might they be inside the legal department of the SOE back at home? Or might they be inside the legal department of the SOE's U.S. branch here, just not the manager? Uh, they may be in the in the in-house department in in the headquarters, but they mm -hmm. they're not the top legal manager in the sure. U.S. Yeah. Oh sure, yeah, well, junior, yeah, yeah junior lawyer. Yeah. And uh, because of that, uh, I think in the future you will see more, uh, more uh, a higher chance that uh, someone expatriated by the Chinese headquarters, the Ch SOE's headquarters in China to be U.S. licensed lawyer because of, you know, the, the you know, they already spent some time, like a decade in the Chinese SOE, they built their track record. Uh, 
and they got gained trust and they, they got to the management position, right? High management position. So they could be sent to, to the US. So I think this is, you know, a, 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 a moving, right? This is a moving trend. So in the future, I think we'll see more uh, expatriate with US uh, license. And second question, very good question. I mean, you see Jindu, uh, Junhe, uh, Dacheng, Dehong, they all have US offices. And um, I think they, they, their function is more like uh, uh, the, uh, the Chinese companies outside general counsel, right? Um, they, they, uh, they manage their US, they help the Chinese clients manage their US legal matters, but they, um, they are general list, right? Um, they, they, don't litigate. Uh, well, some of them do, but uh, for very complicated uh, IP litigation, they tend to outsource to, uh, they either outsource to US law firms or their clients directly uh, assign the work to US litigators, right? Um, it depends on, you know, their relationship with their Chinese clients. For big Chinese companies, they already, they have been working with US firms for a long time. So they, they have their pool of lawyers that they will go to. So um, so for them, they, they actually will bypass the Chinese firms and go directly to US litigators, to US lawyers. But for some Chinese companies, they still prefer to go through Chinese law firms. And for them, you know, the Jindu and Junhe would act as, as their general. They're, they're outside U.S. General Counsel, and they will help bring all the legal resources together and help their clients resolve their U.S. legal issues. Yeah. Right, right. So um, I see a couple of great questions here I want to tee up. Um, first, do, do Chinese companies use arbitration in the U.S.? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. I... Um, I actually published an article with my colleague, uh, Kerry uh, Mankomato. Uh, it came out uh, two years ago in uh, Harbor Negotiation Law uh, Review. Uh, you, you can find it uh, on Google. Um, I, I find that, uh, uh, oh, I think if I remember correctly, 80% of mm -hmm. Chinese companies have uh, arbitration provision in their business contracts in the US. So they, they strongly prefer arbitration. So, and there's evidence to that. And um, um, yes, there's definitely a, 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 a strong preference shown by in, in my research, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. What kind of arbitration? Are they going to a particular institutional arbitration form generally? Yes, yes. And uh, well, when it comes to uh, uh, arbitration, I mean, the, the place of arbitration, a vast majority, uh, would go to U.S. arbitration, and mm -hmm. uh, minority would uh, choose uh, uh, Hong Kong. I th uh, well, outside the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. I, I my guess will be Hong Kong, and a oh. very very small minority would would arbitrate in China. So the not, vast not Singapore, uh, uh, maybe, but uh, you know, I uh, in the question it doesn't have it doesn't spell out as a specific. Mm -hmm. It just U.S. arbitration arbitration outside the U.S. Arbitration in China. So basically, China, U.S., and third country, including okay. Singapore, Hong Kong, I, I, but very small minority would would go would would, would, would pick that option, right? Uh, the vast majority would choose U.S. arbitration. So um, one question comes from an attorney at uh, Morrison Morrison and Forster who says. A major part of my practice is representing Chinese companies and individuals in U.S. courts. In your study, do you see an uptick of Chinese companies and individuals being involved in litigation in recent years? And if so, in what areas? Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so over time, right, um, I, I think... Um, so uh, based on my interviews, right? Based on the interviews, my uh, the, the empirical data, Bloomberg, uh, based on Bloomberg, Bloomberg law data, is just focus on uh, what happened to the companies uh, in, over time, right? Uh, look at the total, the sum of lit uh, litigated uh, cases in federal courts. But based on my interviews, um, I think 
um, um, there's the shift from, um, you know, uh, for, for, for law firms, right? Uh, for law firm that uh, serve Chinese multinationals, their, their work has shifted from corporate uh, work, right? Cross border and the transactions to litigation and compliance. So yes, um, so if the question, if the question is what happens over time, the, the answer is over time, you see more and more uh, litigation and compliance uh, work uh, relating to Chinese uh, clients. But there's also this concern about whether this is a sustainable, right? If you have this long-term decoupling, right? And the Chinese uh, clients increasingly distance themselves from the U.S. jurisdiction, U.S. market, then over time, there will be fewer and fewer disputes uh, uh, in, in the U.S., right, all related to the U.S., and then there will be fewer and fewer lawsuits and compliance issues. So uh, in the short, the answer is in the short term or medium term, yes, there will be more and more probably more and more uh, compliance litigation work relating to Chinese clients. But in the long run, if the decoupling continues, you may see a decline over the long run of litigation work uh, relating to China. Yeah, so that's that's my answer. Is, is the short-term increase that you are predicting because um, there are more Companies, well, it can't be because there are more Chinese companies, because as we know, the number of Chinese companies now entering the U.S. market has slowed already because of the climate. So so, so maybe I should phrase it this way. is What is the reason for this short-term increase that you are predicting? Um, is it because um, Chinese companies have become larger and are doing more acquisitions, doing more activity because you identified greater activity? as being a trigger for litigation and increased size is a trigger for litigation or is the increased litigation because Chinese companies have become targets um, both be possibly because of the larger uh, climate that they're operating in? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, you're. I think you're right. You know, the high profile doesn't help Chinese companies this day of out of the radar of plenty of lawyers, right? Uh, yeah, they, they have become target. They, they are now under spotlight. Uh, so people's attention will, will, will trigger some uh, lawsuits and legal disputes. And second, uh, compliance, right? The compliance, now US regulators really scrutinize Chinese uh, invested businesses. So, um, you know, there's a lot of compliance work. And also um, uh, Chinese companies are now suing U.S. parties, uh, uh, you know, for a lot of companies, some uh, a large number of companies have already left the U.S. market. They, they cut the tie already. But for those that stay, that means their U.S. operations are very important for them. And um, so sometimes they feel they have to fight back uh against the u.s government against uh, you know some u.s parties that uh, threaten lawsuit um so um because of the high stake um uh, in the u.s they they have to they have to litigate sometimes when I mean, you see that you know litigation by huawei litigation by TikTok, right they they uh, you know it's just so important for them um and uh, and uh, you know even though uh you see some Chinese companies exit the U.S. market. You still have companies uh, investing in the U.S., right? Yeah. Companies in sectors that have nothing to do with national security, even although, you know, it's hard to say, you know, these days, Mm -hmm. um, because the the boundary of national security has been expanding, right? <laughs> Anything can be national security threat to the to U.S. politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, if you set up a, a local restaurant uh, mm -hmm. selling Chinese takeout, right? It's hard to say this is a national security threat. Uh, um, so so you still see you know. Um, uh, especially private Chinese companies investing in the U.S. in non-sensitive sectors. And that will bring, you know, some some litigation work in, in, the, in the long run, but in, 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 in the future. But uh, big clients, right, big clients may change their strategies in the U.S. and that may have 
implications on on their litigation and uh, and compliance work in the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you collect any data about the outcomes of the litigation, um, yep. including success rates, winning, um, winning the U.S. litigation, and how did you compare that with other foreign multinationals? Good, very good question. So yes, I did in the survey. Uh, even though the the data is not complete and is subjective, um, but as as uh, as I expected, um, because the Chinese, as I shown you, right, one of the charts showed that the majority, the vast majority of Chinese uh, managers want to settle legal disputes in the U.S. And because of the strong settlement preference, they only litigate cases that they are almost. 100% certain that they will win, they will win and they will prevail. So, and because of that selection process, what we observe is that Chinese litigants prevail in US courts in most of the cases. The win rate is really high. Mm -hmm. uh, and because they only litigate cases that they are pretty sure they will win, yeah. Um, so that that's that's my observation, and uh, but it's based on survey data, maybe biased. Uh, so um, I'm in the process of collecting data about the outcome of the lo lawsuits. So um, more objective data will, will come in the future. Are SOEs an exception to that, though? Because you said that in SOEs, the incentive system is such that um, that managers in the US entity might feel the need to litigate rather than settle because the settling might be less, um, they might be suspected of having done something they shouldn't have done, settled too easily, and therefore they would be pushed to litigate. So is do they, do SOEs have a somewhat worse litigation success rate? Based on my, again, you know, the, this uh, survey data, uh, the size is limited. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, right now, the the uh, the result is statistical uh, result is not significant, meaning that SOEs in that sense is not that uh, significantly different from POEs. But I I would not conclude based on that find because the data the sample size is small, so it lacks power. So I I need more. I am I'm collecting more data to to evaluate that exact question. Very good question. So that's. Mm -hmm exactly what I want to find out in the future. Okay. Yeah. This book is not the end. Not the end. It's, it's the second of a, a trilogy, right? Uh, there's uh, another one. Uh, and I hope uh, I hope there's another one. I mean, uh, who knows? I mean, uh, my sample has been declining, decreasing every year because uh, Chinese companies exit the US market due to the geopolitical environment. So my sample is getting smaller and smaller. So uh, I don't know. I hope in the next four or five years, there's still a sizable body of Chinese multinationals in the US for me to research. Otherwise, I have to switch topic. <laughs> I hope that won't happen. <laughs> you won't be forced to do that. Um, we have a question about mediation. This is a good one because, as we know, mediation has become uh, well, it's always been an important method of dispute resolution domestically in China, and politically, it's been emphasized in recent years in China as a preferred method to resolve um, disputes. Uh, you have court mediation, for example, um, judges mediating before they hear the case. So what is the trend in the U.S., um, and um, what kind of role do you see the Singapore Convention might play? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, good question. I mean, uh, um, so this this book focuses more on the legal, right, the litigation part of it, uh, because it's you know I, I want litigation is such an important part of doing business in the U.S. and in that sense, it's very different from from you know doing business in China. And um, so that that's the focus of the book. But mediation is a very important, I, I think, interesting topic. Um, I, 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 will, I would love to explore in the future, and it's not in the book. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Singapore Convention, I, I think, uh, is um, 
it's impacting the U.S. It's, right now. It's limited, right? China is, you know, big supporter of that, but uh, uh, in the U.S., um, I haven't seen that as a significant part of uh, resolving legal disputes. Of course, you know, big, when you go to court, or court uh, judges will encourage you to first, you know, go litigate, uh, mediate, right? Or normally, mm -hmm. you have a room in the courthouse for for that purpose, right? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, and jams is growing, right? Their the business is growing, uh, so I, I'm sure uh, Chinese, uh, and also because of the cultural background, I, I'm sure Chinese mm -hmm. companies would love to mediate mediate their 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 disputes. But um, you know, as we see from the data I show you, right, and uh, uh, you know, TikTok's data. Um, it's obvious that the Chinese companies are often the defendants, not the plaintiffs, right? They are, they, they are dragged to courts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. whether or not they, uh, you can mediate uh, 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 and settle uh, uh, disputes through litigation, I think very much also turns on the other party's preferences, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a complex uh, uh, story that um, I, I think you know, either I or someone else should uh, should explore in the future. Book four of the <laughs> expanded trilogy. Right. There's, a, there's an interesting question about um, what happens when Chinese companies buy established U.S. companies. And the, the questioner specifically cites the case of uh, Shuang Hui buying Smithfield Farms. That was a, Smithfield Farms was a huge U.S. pork producer, the biggest, um, and Shuanghui, of course, was one of the biggest um, in in China in the pork field. Is there um, is there any difference in how the the companies behave, and also is there any difference in how the U.S. plaintiffs behave when they face that Chinese company or that established company once it's become Chinese? Um, so. The question the questioner at says, I believe that to some extent in the pollution suits against Smithfield in North Carolina, that there was a tendency for the US plaintiffs to make use of general anti-Chinese political themes in their lawsuits. Yes, that's that's a great question. Actually, uh, I, I would like to I, I skip that uh, during because of time. Do you mind I, I uh, share my PowerPoint slides? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, so uh, so this this is the variable, right? Uh, relevant to the question. So this is the variable, uh, this is a dummy variable about recent uh, mergers and acquisitions. If the Chinese company recently acquired the established U.S. business, then this is the this dummy is, is one. So this is significant. Actually, I I forgot to mention it in my presentation, and, and thank you for raising the question. Uh, so if a Chinese company recently acquired a U.S. business, it's more likely to be a plaintiff. Uh, it's more likely to be involved in a federal lawsuit as a plaintiff. So if you ask me what's the effect of uh, a, a Chinese acquisition of U.S. business, mm -hmm. this is the effect. Mm -hmm. So how do you interpret that? Well, in the book, I say, well, uh, so um, a Chinese companies may just have buyer's remorse, right? <laughs> uh, it, it probably fail to fully do due diligence. And after the acquisition, there are issues popping up that has to be resolved, uh, have to be resolved through litigation. I don't know, right? Uh, you know, I have uh, some uh, discussion based on interviews, but this is the finding based on the regression analysis. So that's one. And, uh, so in other words, uh, you know, m and transaction is a very important factor, very important variable. So another one will be uh, uh, here, um, this one. This is the recent mergers and acquisitions. So this is intuitive, right? If a Chinese company acquired a US business, very likely, well, the reason for the acquisition very often is to localize the, the business, right? To acquire established business, to acquire the, the, the local talents, right? So normally they will retain the, retain the whole workforce, U, U.S. workforce of the target company. And as a result, you, you, you're more likely to see local 
uh, locally hired uh, legal managers. Basically, the, the target company's in-house counsel will become the in-house counsel for the Chinese business in the US. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, if a Chinese company, if, if a Chinese company recently uh, acquired a US business, it substantially changed its adaptation to the US legal system. It changes interaction with the US court system. Yes. Mm. That, if it would, in, in other words, it could be behaving more like a US company. Right, with right. To litigation. If they yeah, just bring yeah. over the same legal team, the same legal department. Right, right. It's more like a, it's a strategic uh, localization behavior. Right. Yes. Would you say that characterized Lenovo's behavior? Yeah, I think so. I would say because so. They, Lenovo's they purchased cool. IBM. Yeah, uh, yeah. Personal yeah. computer section. Yeah. Right. They, they send very few people to, to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's basically a, a American company, right, when, when it comes to U.S. operations. And actually... Uh, Lo Lo Lenovo, you know, it took a further step, right? As as the global general counsel is an American lawyer, so mm -hmm. I think that really helped Lenovo mm -hmm. to be a global uh, multinational, a global company instead of a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. What one thing that you mentioned in the book, but I don't think you brought up today. I just want to quickly ask you about is um, you mentioned at least in your introduction. Um, that Chinese companies in the US are caught between the sometimes conflicting legal demands of two legal systems, right? So they, to some extent, have to abide by Chinese laws and regulations, as well as by US laws and regulations. And in recent years, we've heard quite a bit uh, from, say, the American Chamber of Commerce in China, in Beijing and Shanghai, and other foreign chambers of commerce about the pressures that their multinationals feel to be to be similarly navigating between US or European regulations and Chinese, that sometimes those sets of laws are directly in tension. So one example is, of course, the um, the Uyghur uh, Prevention of Forced Labor Act in the United States, which says that companies must not have anything in their supply chain that is connected with Xinjiang or with Uyghur labor. And the Chinese immediately put, uh, Chinese government put a law in place, which basically prevents um, companies operating in China from even um, abiding by that US law. So, so American companies often will complain about being caught between the two sets of laws. So what, what are the complaints that you hear from the Chinese side? Um, what are, are there similar examples of ways in which they are simply between a rock and a hard place? Yeah, very good question. Actually, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share my, my screen just very quickly. <laughs> so uh, I, I wrote an article on that specific question. This, this, uh, this is on my SSRN website. Okay. It's, uh, this article, Superpower Legal Rivalry and the mm -hmm. Global Compliance Dilemma. It's, it's coming out in this uh, uh, UPenn Journal of International Law. Uh, you, you can download it. It's a draft, but uh, uh, the, the argument and uh, empirical evidence is presented already in the article. So yes, I mean, uh, US laws and Chinese laws are in conflict, increasingly in conflict, direct conflict, and also intentionally so, right? Yeah. So this caused a lot of problem for 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 Chinese multinationals uh, doing business in the U.S. and also for U.S. multinationals exposed to the to the Chinese market, and this is a compliance dilemma, right? Um, and there's no easy easy solution. So in the article, I I, I um, created a, a typology that's three three responses. First, you know, business response. You know, if you have limited exposure in the U.S. or in China, you just exit the market. So you cut off the 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 exposure the dual exposure, right? So you'll be, so you can avoid the 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 mm -hmm. conflict of of laws. Uh, so that's business uh, strategy. Second is uh, uh, compliance strategy. You hire good lawyers, help you design some compliance strategy so that you continue to stay in compliance with both laws that appear to be in conflict, but there are always loopholes in laws, right? For, mm -hmm. for, for, for corporations to, to, 
take advantage of. And the third one is, uh, is a reform strategy. So uh, which include uh, litigation or lobbying, right? Mm -hmm. The Chinese company TikTok has been litigating in the US against the US uh, governments. So that will change US law. So mm -hmm. that as a result of litigation, there's no longer a, a direct conflict of laws between the two countries. And the lobbying strategy, they, they lobby the lawmakers or the, uh, so that uh, the lawmakers will carve out exemptions for some companies, or they will you know, change the substance of the law so that uh, when it comes out, it doesn't cause direct conflict for Chinese multinationals or US multinationals. I mean, this global compliance dilemma is a challenge for all multinationals, right? And there's no easy solution. So in that paper, I, I address the the uh, the question more specifically. Mm -hmm. I suppose one possible solution is restructuring, right? Where you just spin yeah. off. Yeah, the business reaction, business, business strategy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think we have time for one more quick question, even though we sure. won't get to everything. Um, so your study focuses on the dichotomy of U.S. and China, specifically U.S. lawyer versus a Chinese lawyer. Um, but there's an increasing number of legal professionals and firms with an international background and mixed experience um, as a result of globalization. So as you go forward with your trilogy or your four part series or your five part uh, book uh, <laughs> series, um, are you going to be taking that into account? Um, now, I don't know exactly what the, the questioner has, has in mind, but I'm thinking of, um, Places, well, Singapore, for example, which produces a large number of lawyers um, and is a is a has a well-developed legal system, is a major hub of arbitration and mediation now. So um, that could be, you know, a, a mix when we think about this kind of mixed background, international background um, pool of lawyers. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. I think that's uh, uh... Increasingly, right, uh, Chinese firms, uh, their the U.S. offices are now hiring U.S. lawyers uh, to be part of the team. And uh, and uh, U.S. firms also have uh, lawyers with Chinese backgrounds, right? So uh, from the supplier side, mm -hmm. you see uh, increasingly, you know, a, a mixed picture, right? Um, uh, um, but, um, you know, um, I'm also carrying out serious projects looking at Chinese um, immigrant lawyers, uh, lawyers, uh, U.S. lawyers with Chinese background and looking at that uh, cohort of, uh, of legal professionals. Um, I, I think um, um, in the future, right, um, uh, given the geopolitical context, I think uh, the Chinese clients will want to shift their work to Chinese forums uh, that are expanding their business, their, their practice in the U.S. because mm -hmm. of the trust issue, right? Already you see the, that uh, happening with SOEs. SOEs are increasingly um, um, giving work to Chinese forums uh, mm -hmm. with practice in the U.S. because they don't trust U.S. lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, if they give work to U.S. forums, they mainly give work to uh, the Chinese partners working at U.S. forums who have been working for Chinese clients for decades. So mm -hmm. the trust issue is really uh, a major consideration right now, given the geopolitical context. So... Um, so a U.S. lawyer with no Chinese background, I think it's very difficult to get Chinese clients work these days. So mm -hmm. you better join a Chinese law firm uh, or you find a U.S. firm with a partner who have established Chinese clients who have gained trust. Then mm -hmm. you, you work for that partner and gradually you build that trust with Chinese clients. So that's a challenge. For, for U.S. lawyers with no Chinese background. Um, Sounds like solid advice for us to share with our students. So <laughs> with that, I think we've, we're at time, so we'll have to bring it to an end. Um, thank you so much. This has been a really uh, rich conversation. And I, thank you. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm sure everyone has. And um, 
I don't know if you want to share the slide of your uh, your book cover as we close the Zoom. Oh, right. Yeah, well, sure thank you. Cover back up so everybody can take note of uh, oh, right, right. negotiating legality. Yeah. So the, is uh, negotiating legally. legality, Chinese companies in the U.S. legal system. Uh, right. That's available the, already? Uh, it's in May, next month. Available in May. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's published by Cambridge University Press. And uh, yes, so, right. uh, you know, if you're interested, please, uh, please buy a copy or tell your law firm to buy a copy. Right? Or, or, <laughs> so, or if you're fortunate enough to be connected with the law school, ask your library. Great. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, yeah. everyone, for joining us. Yeah. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.